my reasons for, for being here are kind of twofold. And I want to give you just a, a little bit of an idea of, of how I got roped into this, I guess, and then uh, a little bit of an idea of some of the things that, that I've done through this process of being a social media scholar uh, and some of the ways in which I would like to perhaps take it uh, with, with my other research trends in the future. And um, the first reason that I'm here is that I, I got involved with something called the Personal Histories Project based at the Department of Archaeology here in Cambridge. And Personal Histories is uh, an oral history project that, that records oral histories of academics in archaeology and social anthropology, records their life stories, and it often does so through large public events. Sometimes they're panel events with debates, sometimes they're private interviews uh, with individuals. And then has been disseminating the uh, films of those events to try and communicate sort of big issues and life stories in archaeology. And uh, an important part of the personal histories is trying to get together and socialize a little bit. That's why they have cupcakes as their Facebook banner. Um, but they were looking at ways of actually improving the dissemination of their material using social media in different ways. So they had a Facebook page, but how could they better use that? How could they, how could they reach a much bigger audience? And so that, that's sort of the first reason for being involved here. One of the most recent events we did was actually a conversation with, with Tony Robinson. Uh, there's a nice little kind of soundbite clip of that up on the SMK website. Um, and my other personal reason for being involved uh, with the SMK project is that I conduct research myself on uh, the history of communities and landscapes in uh, rural parts of Kenya. And this is a joint archaeology and social anthropology project where we um, are interested in communicating the history of research with a community back to that community and also analyzing how that community uses the past in the construction of its own identity and the way in which they negotiate their, themselves through kind of Kenya's politics in the modern day. And so I'll come back to that in a moment about how um, I would like to uh, use my experiences through this process to better inform what I actually do as a research archeologist in the future. I apologize that this is all rather hastily put together. Um, I kind of started with a few ideas that I wanted to, to explore and the, the personal histories group wanted to explore. And we were aware that within archaeology defined very largely, there's a lot of engagement, um, uh, sorry, a lot of museums and heritage organizations are using social media to kind of get their message out and also to get feedback to inform the practice that they were doing. And we wanted to explore that a little bit further, look at good practice, look at bad practice. We, we're also interested in how individuals, how county archaeology associations, how field projects and different research projects were all using social media and wanted to explore the different good practices and bad practices. We were particularly interested in the fact that a large number of archaeological projects had kind of used crowdfunding to get archaeology going and that a number of projects had used activism, uh, social media for activism to preserve a site or protect a site, for example. And we were interested in exploring that. What I was also aware of is that within archaeology, I'd heard very little in terms of um, using social media to actually get uh, a public to drive research agendas, to set agendas, to engage more so. So there is a lot of communication of knowledge, but not so much uh, feedback and engagement. And I was particularly surprised that archaeologists haven't been using social media to actually physically do research. So whether that be organizing teams to go out and field walk and find artifacts, whether it be getting individuals to analyze aerial photographs looking for archaeological sites. Um, and I think there was a general feeling uh, amongst many people that I spoke to that, that social media is being uncritically used by both heritage organizations and by research projects because you feel you have to. So you set up Facebook and Twitter accounts, etc. And I think that's been a theme perhaps in, in other talks. So what did we do? Well, I, uh, to, to explore some of this further, we set up a, a nice workshop in Cambridge. We invited lots of people within academic archaeology who are uh, engaged with social media in various ways. And you can go on the website and you can have a look at the different talks that are there. We, we've audio recorded these talks, so they're gradually going to be released as podcasts, so you can also go and listen to those talks. Uh, we also set up a, a group space to uh, kind of keep this debate going where we can share information on 
different practices within archaeology using social media and with the idea that we could set up a wiki document whereby the uh, workshop um, attendees can contribute information and, and gradually as a community build a sort of guide to good practice um, within social media use in archaeology. I'm going to really kind of potted sum up some of the results of that, that workshop. So uh, I'm, I'm going to take the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology as an example of, of, of an institution that is using social media in different ways and what it does well and what it does perhaps badly. So obviously it has its own website, it has Facebook, it has um, a Twitter account and then it's actually using Foursquare. And they use it for publicity, they use it to communicate existing kind of knowledge, so um, information about the displays and the collections, and they use it to get nice feedback really from the public, you know, some nice sound bites saying this museum is wonderful, blah blah blah. But there is a question of whether they were using um, that social media uh, feedback in any kind of statistically analysed way. So are we really, are we getting a wide range of comments that we can incorporate back into good practice in some more systematic way? They're certainly not using social media to set the agenda of what is produced in the museum. Uh, I was, uh, they're certainly not using it to generate new knowledge, so people aren't able to comment on uh, the archives, for example, add their own stories, add their own information, add their own oral histories. These are areas where uh, I think heritage and archaeological projects are not making use of, of social media to do that kind of thing. Again, there's this very clear idea that there is uncritical social media use, which is funder-driven. And again, the accounts here, well, they're kind of lapsed. Nobody is updating them on a regular basis. They don't actually have that many views. So are these accounts really reaching out to new target audiences, or are they actually going through the motions and potentially just speaking to an existing sort of audience? Other things that we, we talked about, so there are lots of uh, individuals and research projects which are blogging and communicating existing knowledge and communicating their own experiences, but are they really engaging? There are lots of websites which deal with news about archaeology, new finds and new discoveries. Archeo News even has a very nice uh, uh, iPhone app. Um, but again, it's communication of knowledge rather than interaction. There are a number of archaeology forums which attract both, I guess, general users and academics and intellectuals. There is a bit more kind of interaction there, but again, it's very much communication of knowledge rather than using social media to drive research and to conduct research. Where social media has been used to kind of push research is in crowdfunding in various ways. So dig ventures... Uh, it was is set up actually by some of the guys who were behind Time Team in the later years. And they um, basically offer individuals who donate the opportunity to come and partake in high-profile excavations around the UK. So it's kind of like holiday archaeology, but you, you're dealing with a serious research question. Um, and they're getting their research archaeology done, done. And often it is sites which are in some way threatened, so they're also preserving and protecting sites. And Dig Venture has been very successful of raising several tens of thousands of pounds each of the last two years and will probably continue very successfully. But there are other projects which have tried similar things and have been spectacularly unsuccessful. The Bambra Archaeology Project wanted uh, 10,000 uh, pounds. This is a very big castle site in the north of England, uh, but they were spectacularly unsuccessful. And so our workshop, uh, one, of our, um, uh, one of our contributors explored why Dig Ventures has been successful and why Brambra has not been so. And it's about kind of the way in which you reach out to audiences, I think, the way in which they actually use social media. Brambra simply put themselves on Sponsum and got a £1,000 from people who knew the, the people uh, who were on the dig, and that was it. Whereas Dig Ventures was really run as a, a corporate kind of thing uh, with a lot of outreach work and a lot of publicity. Um, Archaeolink is, is a Cambridge University um, archaeology department based thing trying to link uh, archaeological research projects with uh, a team of people who will do kind of the public outreach. And Archaeolink aims to be a kind of self-sustaining academic project in the sense of getting academic grants to do public archaeology to communicate the results of 
archaeological projects to local communities. But ArcheoLink has actually used Kickstart to kickstart that what should be an academic engagement. And then the, there have been various activism things. This one, thanks to Anne, who pointed out to me the Newport ship uh, where the local community got together and used social media, and now they have a very nice website, to preserve a medieval boat which was, which was uh, threatened uh, through the, the building, actually, of a, uh, of a community centre. Um, so these are incredibly basic conclusions that you probably all have heard many times already, so be careful about uncritical social media and use. Uh, get, make sure you've got the right platform for the right aims. Don't fail like Bambra. But my big issue here and the thing that I was, I'm really keen on following up with is this distinction between using social media simply to communicate existing knowledge versus using social media to engage with the public and to do research. So we might rephrase that as dissemination versus knowledge generation. So why aren't we doing things like the Citizen Science Alliance? Why aren't we doing things like Subsea Observers, which is, I think, my favorite um, citizen science project, whereby um, people who sign up to this can go and count scallops on images of the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic seabed. And the more scallops you count, the higher up the leaderboard you go, and you, know, you become captain of the boat or something like that. Um, but archaeology could actually be doing things like this. We could be taking aerial photographs and getting people to identify archaeological sites within them. We could be organizing large-scale uh, field-walking projects, etc. Or we could be doing things like getting people to upload oral histories that integrate with archaeological research, those kinds of things. So to bring this on to then what I'm actually doing in Kenya, well, social media is, is huge in Africa. And I don't know if we've had many presentations here about social media in the developing world? A bit, yeah. A little bit? Well, well in, in Kenya, I mean, social media is, is everything. It is, it is everywhere. Um, this is a country where large, ports of, uh, large portions of the population do not and, and have never had access to traditional print media, to newspapers, to landlines. And yet, over the last five or six years, they've had uh, almost total coverage of the country in terms of mobile uh, phone networks. Mobile phones themselves are incredibly cheap to buy, much cheaper than in the UK. And over the last few years, there is incre increasingly widespread um, edge and now 3G internet access. And smartphones are becoming more and more um, widespread and easy to buy. And so you will walk through the bush and you'll be confronted by a Maasai guy in a, in a blanket who suddenly pulls out his mobile phone and asks for your phone number. And you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere and you're on a dirt road and there's no landlines, there's no power. But this has really revolutionized the way in which um, people in rural parts of Africa are able to engage with mainstream media and with politicians. Uh, and, and I guess we've been thinking about, well, how can we use this to engage them with social science research in one way or another, whether that be archaeology or social anthropology or, or other issues. So Twitter apparently saved Kenya's election. Kenya's recent election um, just last year, uh, sorry, just this year, has um, been all over the kind of social media news and um, the, the amount of information that has been generated through social media commenting on the election was vast. And that's really kind of been a spark to actually Kenyan politicians and all of the big broadcasting companies recognizing, great, I better move them, recognizing the importance of this. So people have been talking about Kenya as having the next Silicon Valley and it's associated with the Great Rift Valley, for example. Uh, and homegrown technologies, mobile internet technologies like M-Pesa, which actually turns SIM cards into bank accounts and you can SMS money around the country. You can even pay your bills by M-Pesa. And they have their online kind of almost like iTunes, Safaricom Live. And social media comments are integrated in all of the mainstream media now. So the news channels regularly go and see what people are saying on Facebook and on Twitter in their live shows. So I've been working up in northwest Kenya up here where it says Maraquet and Pakot. And this is an incredibly rural area, uh, which has only just got a power line, still has no tarmac roads. And we've been using a local team of data collectors to 
uh, actually map features of this landscape. So in effect, to map the physical heritage of this community. Um, and currently they use um, GPS, uh, small handheld GPSs, digital photography and notebooks combined. And we've gradually been using um, smartphones uh, and the 3G internet signal, which has now come into the area, to communicate with the team and to transfer data back and forth. But we're kind of looking towards the idea that in the future, GPSs, digital cameras, they should all be rolled into one smartphone and we can use the, uh, that technology to get the team to collect information and upload it live to an online digital archive. Um, so we think this is one way in which the community itself can be part of the research process by everyone there in effect being able to upload information, log information and transfer it to an online archive or store about that, own, that community. And we would also like to see the community, this archive, the community being able to add their own comments or information to it. So we have lots of oral histories from the early colonial period, from the 1970s and oral histories that were recorded today. But everyone in that village will have their own version of that oral history. So we would like them to be able to upload their versions so they could tell the stories as their grandmother would have told it rather than um, as we would tell it as researchers. So I guess that's the kind of the ways in which I would like to take this forward as a learning experience. And I think I probably have to wrap up now and given an interview and this talk, I've talked far too much today. So anyway, thank you very much.